Bonjour à tous, à tous. Merci beaucoup encore. Je suis, comme j'ai dit ce matin, je suis ravi d'être ici. Et en anglais, on s'appelle la session maintenant le graveyard shift. Et ça veut dire c'est la dernière session du, du, du congrès. Et les, les, membres, les membres ici, vous avez des autres choses ici pour penser. Par exemple, quelle heure le train Qu'est-ce que je fais pour souper ce soir Les autres choses comme ça. Et puis, euh, alors aussi pour moi, je suis conscient de, de l'heure parce que j'ai euh, une courte présentation pour essayer de réfléchir les choses que nous avons discutées ici aujourd'hui au congrès et puis aux conférences. Et puis, euh, j'ai décidé, décidé de parler en anglais et peut-être en français. J'essaie de faire le deux, quelquefois, on voit. Mais je pense que c'est plus... Par, par, je comprends que c'est plus, plus facile pour m'exprimer en, en, en anglais. Mais moi, j'ai euh, 58 ans. J'ai commencé un nouvel emploi en Suisse. J'essaie de comprendre une nouvelle langue, une nouvelle culture. C'est très différent en Irlande. Et puis, c'est un, un, un challenge, c'est un défi. Oui? Et je comprends bien la, la réalité quand je suis dans une réunion et j'essaie de comprendre tout ce que mes amis, mes collègues discutent. Et je, je pense que je comprends peut-être, euh, comme les Suisses ont dit, 70% de, 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 de que ça dit. Et puis, euh, mais je comprends, je, je ne comprends rien. Et quelquefois, j'essayais. C'est avoir le courage d'essayer de comprendre. Alors, pour ma discussion ici, euh, j'ai un overview. Et je, I will, uh, je pense que je parle anglais maintenant et lentement. Merci beaucoup. I have three things I want to address. What are the key challenges and what are the solutions that we need to find for the future of palliative care? What are the global messages that the speakers have given today for palliative care in France, but also globally? And what is our future? And by our future, I mean the future of Swamp Palliative Francophone. The people who in this room today will be the future of palliative care. This is the reality of our challenge. 40 million people need you. 2.1 million children, for those of you who do children's palliative care, will need you. And I use the example uh, of my colleague Claire Henry in the United Kingdom. When they went through a challenge around the delivery of services, I won't have time to discuss that today. But they produced this book, and it has been developed since, One Chance to Get It Right. And what she says is, we have only one chance to get end-of-life care right for an individual. And at present, this chance is missed on too many occasions. It is our responsibility in palliative care to make sure we do not miss those occasions. And that's why the idea of clinical work, research, and education is fundamental to addressing the needs of those 40 million people worldwide who will need palliative care. Europe is very complex. In my role as the president of the EAPC, I have visited many countries to try and understand the challenges they face, and they are very different in every country. Because Although we think of Europe as a single unit, it is many cultures, many languages, many beliefs, and different needs. And yet, there is a connection and a commitment of those people in some way. There is a strength in how they choose to come together. In my context, in, in, uh, I work in Suisse Romande, And I see how we work as well as we can with our colleagues in uh, the German-speaking part and the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. And we can sit in a room and speak three languages at the same time, four if you include English, and we have a common understanding. Not always, but usually we find a solution, and that's what's important. I don't know what that will mean. I know what it means for my country, Ireland, and it's a challenge. But we need to embrace what that will be. Because in the future, 
irrespective of what happens, people will still need palliative care in Britain, in England. And we are still part of that European family who believe that what we do together is better. So whatever happens politically, the care of people who have palliative care needs does not matter about a border or a frontier. Sometimes the language is confusing. The EAPC utilized this word, one voice, one vision, uh, une voix, une vision. And we try to consider that because that's what we hope we will do. It's not always that easy. Because we live in a world of many languages, languages that are often spoken, and then the things that we don't understand. The example I often give is in Ireland, is the word to say yes. If I ask you to do something in Ireland and you say, I say yes immediately, it actually means no. <laughs> what you need to wait for is the little gap between you asking me, me thinking about it, yes, I'll do that. Then it will happen. If I say it straight away, I guarantee you it means no. Now, you wouldn't know that <laughs> because you're not Irish. So within that, you have to understand the nuance of culture which influences how we do our work. I'm having to learn that now. I am quite sure for my colleagues in Lausanne, it is very hard for them to understand how an Irishman thinks. They're learning. It's good. We know in the way our services are delivered, there are strengths and weaknesses. And some of those we have tried to address. We know that palliative care can benefit our patients and their families. We know that in where we do not have early intervention of palliative care, it can sometimes be a weakness in how the patient experiences palliative care, how they, are, they find palliative care, how they understand palliative care. And one of our greatest challenges across Europe, and indeed across the world, is that the language we use to describe palliative care is not clear. There are many ways to describe it. Palliative care, terminal care, supportive care, end-of-life care. I, there are many different concepts attached to those, which makes it very confusing. So we need, and, and the thing I find most interesting is if you look at the way in which, for example, we refer to palliative care in French as soin palliatif. It's a derivation of an English language word, palliative care. It's been, it, it's been translated into French. But is the meaning the same? The soin palliatif and palliative care mean the same thing. And at one level, yes. And at another, I see difference in the way in which it's practiced and understood. So one of the things we need to do across, certainly in Europe, is be clear about the language of what palliative care is and palliative care is not. One of the main things that we see today is palliative care as a public health issue. The WHA resolution strengthened that so that we see, and this is very much around the message to the ministers, to our political uh, agencies, to say it is essential that you place palliative care within the structure of your healthcare system because in that way, people will be served better in terms of their care at end of life and in the period that leads up to the end of life. One of the challenges is often where palliative care is seen as something extra or something nice that you can give people at the end of life. It isn't that anymore. We have to change that message. Primary palliative care is probably one of the most important things. Where is Sebastian? I know he's here somewhere. Bonjour. <laughs> okay, Scott Murray, Sebastian, they lead on this for EAPC. They are providing us with a, an excellent model of early palliative care and intervention. We need to think about that. And the reason we need to think about that is because people live in community. They don't live in isolation. They live in towns and villages. They live at home. Some people choose to die at home. We need to see what home means. And there have been some very good studies which have tried to, to, to look at that. 
we know that early palliative care can make a difference because we can see on the right of this screen how as our population age, and, and Professor Higginson has referred to this, we are going to need more palliative care. We need to think outside our box. We need to think about new ways of practice because that's the only way that we're going to be able to do that. And that's why we use the language of universal coverage. The other area, of course, is integrated palliative care. One of the, one of the programs that I have been involved in or certainly been uh, supportive of in my role in the EAPC was this study which looked at the integration of palliative care. And, and what this tried to do was it tried to show what were the things that actually influenced the integration of palliative care. It tried to provide a definition. We've seen today in a number of presentations how difficult that can be. But within this, I think there's a couple of points that I I've highlighted in green. That integrated care is around continuity of care. It's not something that just happens now. It's allowing and enabling the patient and family to see that we're supporting them along a pathway of care. It's about a well-supported process. That's the multidisciplinary team. That's the people who will be able to come with their different skills and different backgrounds, whether they're a professional caregiver, a, 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 an aide soignant, a, a benevola, whoever it is, these people are coming to provide that as a group. So we, we consider the team approach most important. But we also are very conscious that there are caregivers who are both paid and unpaid. And one of the questions that we will need to ask with things like migration and, and emigration and moving between countries across those borders is who will provide the care in the future? It's a question I ask myself, who will provide the care for me? <laughs> when I need it, because I will be, uh, you know, when I'm 75 or 85 and I'm looking for a nursing home, who will be the people to provide that care? What we need across Europe, of course, are practitioners, people who do the job. And there are three things I try to teach students that we need from them. One is the ability to think critically and to question. And sometimes for some groups of people, they haven't had the formation to understand why you need to question things. So you have to teach them it's okay to ask questions. They need to be able to make judgments. They need to be able to make wise judgments. And that's why I put wisdom. And in fact, I had a journée au vert in Lausanne last week. And we talked about, um, we talked about la sagesse incarnée, an embodied wisdom because that was absolutely essential to how the palliative care team saw themselves. Our decision-making is about la sagesse incarnée. I use this image not to shock you, but to try to explain to you something about what we do in palliative care. Because one of the greatest challenges that we face is migration. People who are coming from countries where they need to find care and support elsewhere. And the image I'm showing you is really something about our work in palliative care internationally. The soldier witnesses suffering. Each day as practitioners, we witness suffering of other people. We witness that suffering, but the most important thing is we do something about it. We move to action. And he picks that child up and he moves that child to a place of safety. Every single day, irrespective of your professional background or whatever role you play, you do that every day. You witness someone's suffering, you do something about that, you move them to a place of safety and care. And if you remember that, it will answer the question of why you work in palliative care, because you have a response to the suffering of other people. It is a human right. We know that palliative care is a human right, but attached to that is that palliative care is also a question of social justice, that we have people should be able to access what they need when they need it. And we have a voice to do that. That's why advocacy is a key component today of palliative care messages. I'm not going to talk about the EAPC because I hope you know who they are. 
but they do they have they have a, a role here and the role really is to try to reach out to people across Europe in whatever place they are and say we can provide a network to enable you to work for us to work with the SVAP, for us to work with FISP, for us to work with the organizations who are trying to develop things on the ground is critical to our survival as an organization. And most important are the two things, at the, or the three points at the bottom of this slide. We value interdisciplinarity. We value who you are and where you come from. We respect your diversity, and we're willing to work collaboratively. And that's why part of this is to say EAPC wishes to try and find ways to strengthen that collaboration through days like this to enable palliative care here in France to strengthen. It, it isn't starting from the grassroots. You have an incredibly strong movement here. I'll talk about that in a moment. But it's to see what we can do to make sure that it is incarné, that it is embedded in the healthcare system. So what are the messages from our speakers? Well, Professor Leger spoke about two things, meaning and connection. That means we also have a responsibility to connect to ourselves. We have to start that search within ourselves. And part of that is also being clear, what is the reality of our giving care to other people? How do I care for myself if I am giving care? So some of the work in palliative care has got to look at how we care for ourselves and each other as caregivers of palliative care. Because if you keep giving and you don't find a way to replenish that, then you risk things like burnout, which is a terrible loss, both for palliative care and also for you. Michael talked about advanced care planning, and the word I took from his lecture was, we need to talk about it. We need to have those conversations, and we need to have those conversations early. We don't leave them until the last minute. Whether you choose to write it down, I think, is, a, is sometimes a societal issue or a cultural issue. But the most important thing is we need to talk. And we as practitioners have a responsibility sometimes to lead that conversation, to bring people to a point where they realize what's happening so that they can have that conversation. I found a nice picture of a dog in Switzerland. I'm very fond of this dog. I think the mess one of the most important messages I took today is about respite care. Because I was m very moved by the presentation today in the sense that I feel that we have, a, in palliative care, a risk of losing the value of respite care as part of the package of care we offer. It was always there. I'm nearly 30 years in clinical palliative care over d many jobs, and I always remember palliative care patients coming for respite. But in more recent years, that hasn't happened because the patients are more complex. It's much more difficult to find a bed for them because people are too unwell. Or the staff say, we haven't got the capacity to manage a complex sick patient and somebody with respite care as well. So the reality is there's more pressure on families to provide that care. And so we need to think about how do we manage that? How do we shift that thinking so that respite care, which is absolutely vital to the health of the community providing care, does not get lost? And so I raise the question, if we don't have palliative care, respite care, have we lost something we need to reclaim? One of the things I heard from Ros Scott today and from my other colleagues is the voice of the volunteer. And in many ways for me, the EAPC have been developing work particularly around volunteering with a charter over the last four years of my presidency. And one of the key issues there is that the volunteer is a voice of the palliative care organization. We need to change the text. And by that, what I mean is the volunteer is not just the lady who does the flowers. That's a really important role, but they have much more to offer us. And the reality is for our future in palliative care, we will not survive without our volunteers. So for those of you who are volunteers here today, thank you for what you bring to us. Because often, you are the voice that tells me what the right decision is. Because sometimes, you can get lost in that clinical complexity. 
Thank you. Yes, I agree. Um, I'm not even going to begin to try to say uh, anything about Professor Higginson's presentation here today because she said it all. I've, I've very little to say, except perhaps my little fil rouge, if I can add it, which is around collaboration. The key word there is around how do we collaborate. And the only way we can do that is we need to go beyond the frontier. We need to move beyond the border and not let language be a barrier that prevents us from doing that. We, we will find a way, people can find a way to communicate. Um, I know from my experience and from working with my colleagues in Suisse Romande and also here in France, the quality of what you do and what you write in French is exceptional. What we need to do is to get that message translated, and I don't mean translated necessarily just in English, but translated to the wider world. Because I have been to many SFAP congresses, and I have seen things that I have never seen in other meetings in terms of the quality of the presentations, the, the deep philosophical debates that you have around palliative care. Somehow, we need to get some of that translated into the deeper models that we, we provide, as well as the high quality clinical work and research that you do here. My question to you is, where is the next generation of researchers, practitioners, and teachers? Because we're all of a certain age, as I speak to myself, and therefore I know where my retraité will be happening, and I can see it, it's just about here. And the question is, I'm sure a few of us are probably about here. So the reality is, what will be after that? How have we trained the next generation? They will be the people who will learn to speak English better than we, the little ones, the ones at school. How do we get them through to a new world? And our future? Well, I think there's three points very quickly. We need to have one which remembers. The picture on the left is where I trained as a nurse a very frightening, scary experience. But the one that's important to me, which shows how we've changed, is the picture in the middle of the nurse holding the medication. And the reason I say that is this was a poster that was from the 1940s, and it specifically refers to the word dope, D-O-P-E. Now, in English, that means stupid. And what that says is, to one who is ill, here's the dope. There's an implication there that nurses are basically stupid and they're just there just to carry things. That's changed. It's changed in many, many different ways because we work with our patients in many different ways. So we need to make sure we've got those messages, but we are changing and we're looking to the future. Our future is also about how we listen and respond to other people, but also to ourselves. If we can't actually ask ourselves in palliative care, what are the things that we need in order to be good at our job, nobody else will provide it for you. So we need to find a voice that expresses what it is that we need to be good as palliative care professionals and to listen to the cries of help from the colleagues that we work with who are struggling for all sorts of reasons. You know, maybe they haven't got enough finances, maybe their services are closing, maybe they can't get enough clinicians. Whatever it is, we need to try to support each other because it's not about I, it's always about we. And so we need to think, seek new horizons. In Suisse Romande, I'm responsible for a new program of the Pratique Avancée pour les Infirmières. It's a new program. Within five years, we are to have 300 nurses who will be trained at Pratique Avancée. All the nurses have to be able to prescribe medication. This will be a big change for the physicians in particular. And so dialogue is absolutely essential. And one of the differences in Suisse Romande is, of course, this is now a, it's a requirement of the, the Conseil d'administration, the, the canton, and so we have to do it. Um, we need to seek the horizons. We never need to stop learning. We never need to stop going forward. We need to take each challenge as it comes. It may not be perfect, but we need to try because that's what makes that difference in the care that we give. And my final thought, I want to refer to Anatole Broyard. You may have read the book. Uh, in English, it's called Intoxicated by My Illness. Anatole Broyard was a journalist in America, uh, but he was actually a, a man of mixed race, 
and uh, he spoke French predominantly. And he wrote this book uh, describing his experience of dying from prostate cancer. And he had a very short time between diagnosis and death. And in this, what he's saying is, this is the moment when he was being told that he was not going to survive. And I think uh, one of our previous presenters described something similar. The knowledge that you're ill is one of the momentous experiences in your life. You expect you're going to go on forever, that you are immortal. Freud said every man is convinced of his own immortality. I certainly was. I dawdled through life up to that point, and when the doctor told me I was ill, it was like an immense shock. I, was, I felt galvanized. I was a new person. All my old trivial selves fell away, and I was reduced to essence. When we work with patients, we need to think of that transformation that they experience along their journey of illness towards dying. In this case, we would often think when somebody is told that news, they fall apart. It's a terrible thing, and for many patients it is. But he became a new person because what was important was clear to him, the things that were important. For us, the message is we are part of that experience. We are part of that journey. And so we need to consider what we do and how we respond because often we spend much of our time thinking, I don't know what to say. And I worked with a colleague who taught me it's not what you say, it's how you respond. Messieurs, dames, merci beaucoup pour votre attention. C'est avec grand plaisir d'être ici. Je vous souhaite un, un, un bon fin de journée et merci beaucoup encore.